everyone. Welcome to the Life of Education podcast. Today we're here with Liz Terry and Liz, we're so excited to have you here. So Liz is one of our educators for the Chaturanga workshop on a life of education and we've got some really cool plans with Liz coming up soon. But today we're here talking about something totally different. We're going to be talking about rolfing. Um, so Liz, drum roll, do you want to set the scene? <laughs> yeah, so what's funny is a lot of people... When I say I do rolfing, they're like rolfing, like when you, th- you know, you throw up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. No, 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 I didn't know that. Okay, well, no, it's not that actually. It's a, it's a type of manual therapy. Um, well, I'm sure Keith doesn't. You don't know what rolfing is. Rolfing. Rolfing to me is roll on the floor laughing. <laughs> okay, so there you go. So everybody has their own interpretation of what this is. <laughs> is that um, like one of those little memes? Yeah, like lol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, So rolfing is a type of manual manipulation or manual therapy, um, and it originally was called structural integration and is still called structural integration, but the the school of thought split. So one one side of it is called rolfing, named after the, the, um, the founder, the developer, the creator of it, named Ida Rolf. And then the second, um, st- the, the second stem is still structural integration. So yeah, it's really interesting. Obviously, I'm a yoga teacher, and then I moved into this modality um, of manual therapy, and I've brought it to Dubai. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So yeah. what does it involve? So <laughs> that's a great question. He's like, what? <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of, of rolfing um, and how I came to become a rolfer. But first and, and foremost, really interesting, and the reason why I was led to rolfing is that it was created and developed by a woman. And this woman, Ida Rolf, um, was born in 1896 in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. And in her 20s, she... Be, she uh, what's the word? <laughs> she became a PhD in biochemistry. So mm-hmm. she had her PhD in biochemistry. Such an intelligent woman. And she was emerging. She was a revolutionary in this time where women were not as respected for their, their knowledge and their wisdom. Um, <clears throat> so she uh, grew up in New York in the Bronx, and uh, she went to university at Columbia in, um, in, univer- in New York City, and then got her PhD, and then started working at the Rockefeller Institute, um, researching chemotherapy. Wow. And interestingly, um, she did that for a while, and then she took a hiatus, and went to Switzerland and studied astrophysics. Then she came back and she realized, probably in her late 20s, early 30s, she realized that there was so much more to healing than what modern medicine was was, um, providing. So she studied osteopathy. She studied yoga. She was really good friends with Joseph Pilates. um, And she also studied the Alexander Technique and so she, <clears throat> she started to look at, at healing and health and wellness in such a different way. And actually, so much of what we study in the world of movement, in the world of yoga, in the, in the world of health and wellness today, came from osteopathy, came from homeopathy. And, and much of what we're researching now about fascia is, came from rolfing, which is why... I was so attracted to this practice. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> after she came back, she was working dire- uh, really closely or intimately with an osteopath. And she started to look at our bodies so differently. She started to, she started to see them um, in uh, stackable units. And there's a scientific law, I can't remember which law, but it states that when a mass is balanced, when masses are balanced, they're more stable. So she looked at this, and of course, we all have different ways of, of looking at bodies, of looking at each other, of looking at life. And 
so her approach to, to rolfing was, how can we get these stackable units in more of a balance or more balanced to create more stability in people's lives, basically? So that is kind of the birth of rolfing. And it's, yeah. Okay, so she developed the whole rolfing technique after this period of time? <clears throat> so she developed it. She... Um, she claims that she channeled it, actually, from ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, but basically what she was doing was she... So osteopathy focuses on bones and how bones relate to each other. And when they take the approach of looking at bones as a structure, so she took it a little bit further, a few steps further, <clears throat> and she said that if we want to move a bone, let's say a bone is out of place, if we want to move a bone, we work with tissue. And that tissue, if it's relaxed, let's say, I hate to use the word tight, but if it's tight and it's pulling the bone in a certain way, so this manual therapy works the connective tissue in between in order to get the, the body's natural intelligence to bring the bone back to its natural state. <clears throat> so... We, so Rolfing doesn't necessarily take the approach of working with bones. It takes the approach of working with tissue and muscle and also the intermuscular septa, which is in between each muscle. So when we develop, develop patterns in our body, um, groups of muscles start to work congruently or not even congruently. They work kind of they enmesh together. Um, so independently, they don't work as they should. So one muscle is overpowering another. So what we do is we work in between the muscles to, to get them to work independently as well as together. Another thing that she brought uh, to this technique, this modality, is that when you work locally, we perceive globally, which means if I'm working on the foot of someone and they have an, you know, an elbow that's in pain, it doesn't mean that me working on the foot isn't concentrating on the elbow. If I work on the foot, I could absolutely impact that pain in the elbow because the body is so connected. So she, going back to these stackable units, if one stackable unit is out of place, that means that the whole unit, the whole body is out of, is out of place. So, or, or can be off balance, if that makes sense. So yeah, so she came out and she also, uh, because she was studying also uh, physics, um, she was looking at how we relate to gravity and science, from a scientific perspective uh, we always talk about gravity as a force and she actually came forth and was like why don't we look at gravity as a relationship instead of as a force because as a force oftentimes well what she would see physically in, in structure is that it would be forcing bodies down, right? So people, as we age, we start to hunch forward. We start to kind of lose our, our balance. Our hips become more unstable. Our body becomes more off balance. So with this, this technique, this modality, she wants, even no matter if you're 90 years old, 80 years old, no matter what, all of these units are in balance so that you can be in relationship with gravity rather than allowing gravity to kind of push you down mm. yeah how do you feel about that Keith <laughs> so what does a uh, like when when do you use it when do you say oh you're a perfect candidate for this new technique that I know and it's called rolfing come here and let's go yeah so everyone is a candidate for rolfing because not only is it uh, does it impact the physical structure but it also works on trauma like physical trauma emotional trauma um, it because our body stores so much of our memory of our memories from the past if if we let's say for instance since I am a yogi you know if we go directly to meditation without actually looking at our body and and noticing the sensations and and feeling in our body into our body meditation can take us so far out in the ethers if you will um, without being grounded so being in the body and, and rolfing really helps to ground people as well. But 
for myself, I'm focused on typically people with chronic pain um, and uh, sometimes uh, that chronic pain is linked to something, a memory or an mm -hmm. emotional response that they're not, they're not acknowledging mm -hmm. or, I mean, I had one situation where I was working with my teacher. He was doing uh, a session uh, in my head, on, on my cranium. He go, we go into the nose and into, into the mouth. And there was a memory that came through that I had forgotten about that when I was, I think, three years old. And I had to get stitches in my eye. And that memory came into my, to my peripheral, peripheral vision um, as he was going into my mouth, into my nose. And I was like, whoa. That clearly hadn't been unresolved in my body. So, um, so I'll talk about what rolfing is. So yeah, if someone comes to me with chronic pain, if someone comes to me um, who's interested in understanding uh, there's a social aspect of how we, how we present ourselves to the world and how, um, how our bodies, like how bringing, bringing attention to our body can actually change how we, how we view ourselves and how we present ourselves into the world. So the social aspect. Um, so if someone comes to me with chronic pain or I like working with athletes as well, um, or people who've suffered trauma, I, I, those are the three categories, which is, quite a big yeah. group of, of people. Um, they come in and each session is about 90 minutes and it's 10 sessions. It's a 10 series um, recipe, if you will. And every session we focus on something different. We focus on a different part of the body. So what are the 10 different sessions that you do? Yep, so the first session we work with the breath the, the goal is to, to free the breath, to bring people into, because the breath can be one of our greatest resources. Mm -hmm. So we focus on the breath, and with that intention, we connect the rib cage to the pelvis from a structural standpoint. Then the second session, we move to the feet, so we work literally the knees to the toes for 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we get into the intermuscular septum. We get in into like places in the legs that people probably have never felt before. And are you using your, your hands and your pressure yeah, so or are you using tools? It's No, it's hands. Okay. Hands, elbows. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Fingers. Um, the third session, so the first three sessions go together. They're the more the more, uh, we call them the sleeve. So if we look at the body from like the koshas or um, different layers that go mm -hmm. from the outermost layer to the innermost layer. We work the outermost layers first. The third session is the lateral line. And then the fourth through the seventh session are called the core sessions. So these core sessions go deep. And these are the, these often, especially with the people that I've worked with and, and myself included, these are the most emotionally, can be the most emotionally charged and also uh, the most uh, intense sessions of the of the whole series, because they go deep. So we do. When you say line. deep, do you mean physically deep, or do you mean emotionally deep? It's so we go into like the pelvic floor, not into the internally into the pelvic floor, but we work the midline for the fourth session, and we go into the sit bone. Um, the there's a muscle that wraps around called the obturator internus, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we work that muscle. So then the, the, the fifth session is we go back up to the upper body into the psoas. So we go like into deeper structures yeah, yeah. within in the physical body, um, which then can, can stimulate or trigger certain emotional responses for people, especially working with the psoas. Not a lot of, you know, I mean, a massage therapist doesn't necessarily work with your psoas, mm. right? Um, no, there, there are certain modalities that do work with so with your psoas, but because this is a specific recipe, they all build on to each other. So I was going like to ask you that. So, do you then like you teach in the breath so that they can recruit the breath while you're working yep. in session two and in session three and in session four? All the way up to yeah, ten. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yep, and you know, even as a yoga teacher, I think the most mm. important aspect of my teaching, in general, I've been teaching for eleven years, and I find that that just bringing people, it's not even teaching people how to breathe, it's bringing people into the awareness of their breath 
and understanding that the breath is a resource, meaning in any situation of our lives, we can use the breath as a resource in any situation to calm us down. Mm -hmm. We can use the breath to bring clarity into our mind, into our situation. And and the same goes for... And physiologically to take you into a like parasympathetic yeah, yeah. state sure. immediately immediately sure. it's it's really powerful it's so powerful and, and it's really under uh under undervalued used. and yeah. yeah yeah absolutely um and interestingly at the beginning when when ida rolf started this 10 series it was a nine series and she started with the feet the foundation but then she realized what i'm missing something so great and it was the breath so now we start with the breath and move move forward but we then move back down to the, the bottom half of the body up to the sacrum. So this is still session four, five. Six is the sacrum. Six is the sacrum. Okay. And then so four is the obturator internus. Five is? Five is the, the psoas. Psoas, yep. Six, yep. six is, is the sacrum. Sacrum. Mm -hmm. And now the body, now that we've gotten all these stackable units all into balance, now we're ready to put the head on. Right? So the head is one of these, first of all, with, with technology, with how we live our lives, our head is so far forward. And so people come to me and they say, I'm so, I have so much pain in my back. And when I look at them from the side and I look at how they're standing, their head is so far forward. And I'm like, that could be one of the main issues mm -hmm. as to why you're in so much pain. And also it's like head forward. I mean, there's all these... Um, there's all these these ways in which we can interpret the way we hold ourselves, right? So a head forward is like we're always looking towards the future. Or when we round forward, we're protecting our heart. We might be grieving. You know, we protect our lungs. So there's, there's all of these, um, the way that, that our traumas, that our emotions manifest in our body is, is very apparent in a, in really all of us um so you put the head on this yep, is so we seven then, yeah so seven eight. we work the shoulders the neck um the cranium we work um the sphenoid and mm -hmm. through like we work the sphenoid through the through the mandible through the jaw um and then we work through the nose the nose is pretty fascinating how do you work through the nose <laughs> because it has so much like because there's so many ligaments and tendons mm. in the fa in the facial structure, there's so yeah, many there's muscles, fingers. everything. So do you go up into the nose? Yeah. So we use gloves, and I thankfully have a very small little finger, um, but we go into yeah, the you nose. Yeah, you get the same reaction. I yeah, have. I was like, Just yep. yeah. yeah. And <laughs> some people opt to mm. not have it, but honestly, the mm. nose can be one of the most transformational mm. experiences for people because, especially if you've been punched in the face if you've yeah. been knocked down well it's really interesting that you say this phenode because we had um so do you remember dr linnell she did yeah. a podcast with us and she was talking about she also did a, a course um talking about the nervous system and she was saying that the cranial bones actually come out of alignment first through this phenode bone and mm -hmm. then um it triggers misalignment everywhere and actually inflammation of the nervous system coming through the cranium and that when that's realigned, so that's the first place that she realigns through KST, um, then everything else kind of calms down. So it just stimulates this sympathetic nervous system response. Do you remember any of this? Not no, really, <laughs> not really. But I, I do remember that her, her, her whole talk was on the nervous system. And yeah, to yeah, and the particularly the sphenoid bone um, of the when she does cranial uh, therapy through KST, it, which is a different approach, um, but just in relation to why it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Interesting that you mention her because she's, she has referred one of her clients to Rolfing, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. She, it's a, it's a compliment to what she does. Um, and that's one of the biggest things about Rolfing is too, it, it, it balances, it down regulates the nervous system. So it, 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 um, it stimulates the parasympathetic response. And when we, when we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system response, our body has more access 
to bring itself back to its natural state. So that is the whole, like, when it comes to, like, the whole pic big picture, that's what we're doing in Rolfing. And, yeah. yeah so Alignment, homeostasis. Uh, yeah. yeah, for people listening, the, the, the parasympathetic is, is part of your autonomic nervous system where all the relax, rest, happy... Yeah, rest, digest, and reproduce. Yeah, rest, digest, reproduce, where everything's great. Mm -hmm. The opposite to that is the sympathetic end or sp of the spectrum, which is kind of my pro sciencey way of explaining it. Um, and that's going to be where you're stressed, you're tight, you're stiff, irritable, anxious, worried, all those types of things. So what you're talking about now, just when you keep talking about the parasympathetic, is just getting you into that relaxed, calm, happy place. And that also then, while that's in your that's in your brain, that's your, in your emotional state, that manifests itself in a more fluid movement pattern. You're more flexible, you're more relaxed, you're at a higher level of, of output. And so karma, which yeah, is calmer, yeah. ideally, yeah, yeah the state zen. of being that you want to be in. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, so, and then that's, yeah. It's okay. also a mm -hmm. huge, uh, just to, to piggyback on that, um, it's our survival response. So another thing about the structure is that it, we, our bodies are so intelligent and how th our bodies adapt to our, n our movement patterns, the way that we feel that we need to move in order to protect ourselves is so powerful and something that we don't, we don't understand about ourselves because we don't connect to our nervous system. Like it, it's just an automatic, mm -hmm. you know, an automatic thing. So so with rolfing with these specific modalities that help to downregulate the the parasympathetic it allows our body to reset it allows the body to come back to its natural state so that when we do need to to go into that survival response our body will be more prepared and, yeah. and you know i think what's really what's what people sometimes uh, don't or overlook when it comes to the parasympathetic nervous system is once you take your body as so you envision it like a seesaw and you've got the seesaw like fluctuating depending on the stresses of the day and when you take yourself into a place where you're much calmer or relaxed which is like parasympathetic uh, that you're actually your body's actually able to start repairing some of the say DNA damage or some of the damage on a cellular level that's happening through your body as opposed to always sending uh, energy and blood to the periphery so that you can take action yeah. uh, in your life as opposed to, oh, okay, we've, we're calm, we're relaxed, every, we're safe, we're safe. We're now going to start repairing maybe this little tear here, yeah. maybe this, maybe that, maybe realigning that. So I think that's also one of the, the attributes yeah. of being in a much calmer state of being is that it's your like body's an, able to go and do it's that. It's like an allocation of resources. Yeah. When you're happy and calm, you're well fed, you're around loved ones, right? Your body can okay, say, okay, we don't, we're not going to need to jump up and run. So let's use our resources to fix, 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 and all the things you said, as mm. opposed to, okay, now there's somewhat of we're a in threat danger. Yeah, around us. So now we need to, let's not digest that food right now. Let's not repair those cells. Let's get ready to run or fight. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, so once you've done all of the 10 sessions and we just spoke about putting the head on which is session seven eight no nine seven. eight nine and ten. Eight, nine, and ten are integration oh okay so basically what it eight nine and ten we work lower body or upper body or whatever whatever part of the body is less resourced we do testing and everything then we go to that place and then the next session is the other the other part of the body so we constantly go from a upper body to lower body upper body and then so many layers in between. Mm. Um, and then 10 is, the, is very energetic. Um, it's, it's, it's more superficial. So we don't go deep into the tissue um, as far as like pressure is concerned. And that basically is tying up all of the work that we did in one through nine, tying up kind of like putting the, the bow on the top of a present. Like it's, it, it brings the body to remember, okay, this is what we did for the past 10 weeks, and now my body's ready to be more 
resilient and more resourced out in the world. Now, does that mean that you never do another 10 series or you never do another rolfing session? No, mm -hmm. because as we all know, we go back out into the world and our environment impacts and, and affects how we move and how in our body and how we appear in the world, how we react to things. Um, but it, it definitely allows, it, it brings more attention and, and it allows, allows people to become more embodied and more aware of how they're moving. So it's also, I mean, it's, it's mainly an education for people to understand how they're moving. And like, I've been sitting like this with my knee, knees crossed. I should probably move now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like educating people that movement is also essential and how you move is important. Like mm -hmm. what you do, it's very important. So people will come in after public, we, we, we ask six months in or, like go out into the world, move your body as you move, do what you need to do. And then if you need, we call it a tune up. If you need a, a rolfing tune up, then we'll do a rolfing tune up. Mm -hmm. But typically people don't need more than one 10 series for quite, quite many years. So I'm curious, how quickly do you do them? Do you do them like in 10 days or do you do right. it like one every two weeks or once a month or what happens? So Typically, I recommend once a week, mm -hmm. so it would be 10 weeks. So mm -hmm. it is a commitment, but it's a commitment for yourself, mm -hmm. right? Um, but s oftentimes, that's not always feasible for people's schedule. So we recommend that you don't go above uh, uh, more than a month mm. between sessions. Yeah, fair enough. So it could be two every two weeks. It could be, mm. it could be twice. You could get a full year out of it then, essentially. You could do a f almost a full yeah. year. I and is there homework in between, or is it purely treatments well so being a yoga teacher as well now a, a, as well as a rolfer we all know how homework goes yeah. right? so basically if i can if i can let someone go with one little tidbit of information just so that they are aware within that time of integration that they're aware of how they're sitting how they're moving how they're standing up how they're walking or just even just you know notice your feet as you're walking Mm. that's that's simple enough right yeah. I, I'm not going to give them like a an exercise program because first of all we have people like you we have people um we have yoga teachers who do yoga which is a powerful practice in between you know we have these movement practices which are really important to yeah. maintain in that integration phase so so what I was <laughs> gonna uh, now uh, what I was sort of thinking is is it reliant is there a progress curve that's reliant on like if I do one session on the start of each month if I smash my homework for four weeks is the second session going to be at a higher level do you oh, know what I mean it very well could okay. I mean to be honest when I work with tissue there is a distinct difference of the the quality or the texture, I'll, pu I'll put it that way, the texture of tissue with someone who has done, um, who, who is very aware of their body as opposed to someone yeah, yeah. who is not. So I've worked with, with people along that spectrum, uh, many, many points al along that spectrum. And, and uh, tissue responds more quickly when people are more aware and also who, people who are engaged in the process because it is a 50 50 it's a 50 percent relate 50 50 relationship mm -hmm. where it's not a massage where you just lay on the table mm. and i go in and i work with you it's actually i'm working with i'm i'm guiding movement in your body you're you're moving as i'm working and guiding tissue so it's it's not where you're passive it's mm -hmm. a very active yeah yeah you know, uh, active 90 Good. minutes. Um, and it goes by like that. It goes by so fast. It goes by so fast. Is it fast. laborsome for you as a therapist? Yes and no. I mean, there are different ways that I'm learning how to uh, work with tissue. And basically, I'm uh, their, their tissue, everybody, you know, because we have, I mean, my fingers, I think hands in general, we can, they communicate. And when, when I feel that body communicating back to me, my body is letting me know exactly where I need to go. Mm. So I don't even need to go deep, mm -hmm. per se. Um, I just have to know and, and just listen to where the, the tissue wants me, wants me to go. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One thing I did want to tell you, um, I wanted to talk about a story about Ida Rolf. 
she um she worked with a kid four years old his name is tim law and this was in 1959 he had a, a rare bone disease i can't remember what it's called um but the doctors wanted to basically put him in a cast for five years, a whole body cast for five years. Because, the, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was that his bones were unstable or what, but his, his family thankfully knew Ida Rolf. And she was like, no, we're going to do the 10 series and see how we go. And then they said, you'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. This kid was four. She did this 10 series. He never went into a wheelchair, never went into a cast, and he's been walking and he's a healthy, he's been a healthy mm. person. And now he, he lives a healthy life with two kids. So this work is, is so powerful and oftentimes there isn't a solid scientific answer to it, yeah. but we know it because it's there, like that person's experience. And that's really in- extremely powerful is how people feel within themselves. Yeah. And how I mean, look, powerful. you've got your uh, you've got your absolute physiological effect coming out of a session. You have that psychological benefit. Then you have the whole contextual experience of going to a therapist, having someone who's mm-hmm. helping you, having that experience of like this person cares for me. I'm getting treatment. I'm going to solve my problem. They leave feeling better. Da-da. So there's there's that whole. Um, thing plugged into every you know little modality and then I really believe that the things wh- why chiropractic will work for some people some some person but you'll have the same your colleague same problem you'll recommend the same chiropractic they'll do the same thing and it'll have no effect on this person yep. acupuncture same same all of these ones massage that person was great go to see that person that per- you the, your colleague goes with exactly the same shin splints or calf pain whatever it is didn't do anything. I really believe that everyone's nervous system is craving out for something. And we don't know enough to be able to say, you should do chiropractic, you should do acupuncture for that. That when they, when they go through the experience of, of those things I said, like just, just A, the treatment, anything, somebody touching you, somebody being there, somebody helping you, they're at a level where, of benefit. And then after that, it's, uh, it's that neurological, physiological benefit from the actual intervention. Am I making sense or am I just talking? Yeah, yeah, no, you're ma- you yeah, you you're making sense. So I think maybe I you don't mind if I I've had an experience with rolfing, so I'm gonna share that. <laughs> um but this is way before you became a rolfer, but we have a very a close friend of both of us. Um her name's Sylvie and uh she lives in Germany. So I went to Germany to go visit her and uh she said to me, I, I have this great therapist, she does rolfing, come and I'll take you to go to go to see her. And I, I think at the time that I was visiting her, it was my birthday or around my birthday, so she's like, I'm gonna give this to you as a gift, so let's go. Um and I had, I think I was two years post my accident. No, maybe a year yeah, and a I half. Yeah, I think I remember this. I yeah. we'd, we'd started by that stage. Yeah, yeah. I was about a year and a half, maybe a year and a half after my accident. So I went into this room and there was like a, a mattress on the floor. It was like a bed, but it was elevated. Um, and it was like a mattress. And I remember laying on the mattress and this woman started to put her hands underneath my body and just... And uh, I almost kind of went into this, like, you know when you fall asleep but you don't fall asleep and you're in, like, this weird trancey kind of I'm awake but I'm not awake? And literally it was about maybe, I think, I don't know how long I was there, but it felt like a long time. I was there for, for ages. And I remember getting up and walking outside and, I, and Sylvie was sitting there waiting for me and I started crying my eyes out. And I literally was crying for about 20 minutes. I couldn't stop crying on the side of, of this woman's waiting area. And I kept saying to her, like, this isn't your fault. This is just me. This is me. And she was like, it's okay. Like, I, I know you just, you chill. And I literally, I remember Sylvie sitting next to me and I leaned into her and I cried on her lap and I was just letting out so much emotional stuff. And I cried on her for like 20 minutes. I made Sylvie late to her class. <laughs> we didn't go anywhere because <laughs> I was an emotional mess. But that was the first time I ever had rolling and my first experience with with like 
that type of treatment. So I think it can be very, look, I'm not saying that everyone's going to have the same experience as me. And I think people are going to walk away from it with different things. Um, but if you're in a place where you you can be quite sensitive to it, then it can be very, very powerful. And I think if you're quite shut out, it might not be. Um, but obviously, that was my experience. I just wanted to share it with everyone. Well, I think that the, the shutting out, if you should, uh, if you are in a position of shutting out any treatment, it's not going to work. Like sports massage works. But if you're in a position of showing up going... I don't buy into this. I hate people touching me. I don't mm. think you know what you're doing. Blah, blah, blah. You're going to walk out just as stiff and you know rrr, anti the whole experience. It's not going to work. You need, if you want any th- sort of treatment to work, you need to be open to the change that's, that's going to be, that you're going to feel, do you know? Mm. I think another thing, the r- we've been misguided in that we feel that we have to have someone above us to help us. Like that we need someone for our own healing. And what what I think is really important moving forward is that the people that are that are healers that are in these modalities are actually there to to empower you and to educate you so that you understand that you have this beautiful resource that when you know when you're working with someone you the the way that you approach it the way that you believe in it yourself is is like 50 percent of your healing Mm. so it's like how do you how do you trust yourself Mm. in this process not just how do you trust this person but how can i trust myself that this is what i need and that's really important too i think and that's why you know as as rolfers we're we don't consider ourselves healers we consider ourselves educators because it's, it's really about educating people. And also with, with your story, with your experience, mm-hmm. I mean, so many people, I've had that with Rolfing too. Mm. And it's- People just crying on you. Yeah, but also me, I, I cried for a long time. I've cried many times in As a in patient Rolfing. or as yeah, a therapist? Yeah, as, as a client, as, okay. a, as a patient. And it's the body stores so much that we don't even, we, have, we don't even realize and even if we feel it as a sensation of pain, that could actually be an emotion that you mm. have, s- that's been stuck there for yeah. so long. Well, I think in, in my experience, for sure, it was, because you and I have had, we've been friends for a long time. We've had many like spiritual experiences together, <laughs> but even we had, uh, we had a moment where we did ayahuasca together. And I remember in that, I also cried a lot. Yeah. The first time together, a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot. So I think there was a lot of trauma that I was like holding on to. And any time I did any therapy that touched on any like uh, energetic stuff, it would just all come out. Um, yeah, there was a lot of crying in that first ceremony. And it's beautiful because somehow it's a release that we need, mm. right? It's like this, and sometimes we want to contain ourselves and pull, pull ourselves together and be all perfect all the time and that that actually creates rigidity in the body yeah and it actually can constrict or obstruct your movement in your joints and it's like when we understand this connection then we can start to trust ourselves like i said before trust ourselves that if we allow ourselves to release then we can trust that our bodies will will uh respond to that and you know um yeah, for sure. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's the power of the br- like it's training the brain and the body together. Yeah. And you can the the f- the unfortunate thing when you s- when you get into these conversations is a lot a lot of times the language used flies over people's heads. Do you know? Like if for some people that what the, the way you will phrase it when you talk about like emotions being trapped in your body and that that will land. For other people, nope. pff, forget nope. it. What are you talking yep, about? Exactly. Emotions in my knee, forget it. Not exactly. happening. Mm-hmm. So, like, the, the fundamental principle is the same, that the brain and the body is connected. The brain has the memories. The brain controls the body. So if the brain's not happy, the body's not happy. If, if the brain wants the body to do something, if the body's not able to do it, it's going to send a signal back to the brain, and then you're going to have this mm-hmm. conversation the whole time. Yeah. Like, I live, I live in that realm. I haven't 
stepped into this third tier of spirituality and th- I don't know what you called it at the beginning but you said this thing circles oh, esoteric or ethereal yeah, yeah. I'm not there like the I'm ether. not ethereal <laughs> yeah the ethers yeah I'm in the I won't say grounded but I'm in the two that's just psychological physical like neurological physical and then there's the spiritual wherever you want to put it I'm not in that spiritual realm maybe I'll get there one day who knows but the principle is the same and in the physical world that the brain and the body are so unbelievably connected that I think th- all of these things have so much value but it's just about <laughs> finding the right way to communicate with, with the people if you're trying to save everybody if you're not trying to save everybody if you're just going to you've got your style and this is it boom then, then great um, but I think so one one thing that I'm going to add to that because you said something really interesting about like the brain and the body and the brain and the body so you can think of the brain as also being like the 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 mind or you can think of the the brain as being like the the as being a, another aspect of the body like the physicality the thing that makes things work and I remember something again this is just going back to my accident but I remember one thing that made me think about things really differently you can want your body to do whatever it wants but if your nervous system is not engaged in that process nothing is happening yep. like I remember having this moment after like uh, my accident where I was at home. I think you came to visit me a couple of times at home and my right leg would not move whatsoever. No matter how much in my mind I thought, okay, right leg, move. Right leg or right muscle, like twitch or do something, nothing. And what made it really clear to me is if you do not get your nervous system on board, whatever train you're moving into, nothing's going to happen. So starting from, say, a therapeutical approach where you're dealing with the nervous system first Mm. and then going into the physicality of the body is an interesting approach because without that, you can do whatever you want to that muscle. But if the nervous system isn't on board with what you're doing, that muscle is just going to do whatever the nervous system tells it to. Yeah. They're my two cents. Yeah, and a big big (laughs) part of that is what you said about the breathing because you're getting oxygen into the system. Oxygen is going to feed the brain. You're going to get a better neurotransmission of if you want to just stay on that. If you even if you go back, say, to the breath being controlled Mm -hmm. in a large degree by the cranial nerves, by the vagus nerve, you think a lot about okay, like this is this is brain. I'm starting in this the first aspect. Yeah, and the, that's the breath. That's the oxygen. Yeah. Is that what you're d- saying? Well, no, it's, it's, it's also like uh, I'm, if I'm working with cranial nerves and the first, well, it's the 10th cranial nerve, but the vagus nerve has a lot to do with our parasympathetic nervous system, a lot to do with how we breathe, with our diaphragm, with so many other aspects, then it seems like a very logical place to start, right? <laughs> I'm going to go with the, the, big, the big chunk. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're going to need it for, because now what you're going to do is, in your next nine sessions I'm guessing it's going to be pretty uncomfortable for some people when you're getting in deep into all these weird and wonderful places and if they are going to if they have no strategy to keep control of their nervous system keep control of their breathing keep themselves in towards that parasympathetic relaxed end they're going to shoot off into the stressed sympathetic end because you're digging in in these like if you come at my hip flexor you're not going to get me on the table for more than five <laughs> seconds. So would I'm going to find a w- I'm going to find a strategy to get off that table. <laughs> and what's interesting, rolfing used to be very painful, but now that we actually take the int- we study from the perspective of the nervous system rather than fascia, because now we understand that fascia doesn't change. No matter how much load my body, I mean, I could step on your thighs and your fascia won't change. When you say yeah. we, I, I like. That we needs to be like the big we. Yeah. Like yes. that we. There's maybe the we understand. Yeah. But there's still a lot. We've of we've had a lot of we've had a lot of a lot of discussions about fascia, and I think when we have these discussions, there are some some people and some people within the fitness community that still feel that you can move fascia, and then there's a lot of people that know that it is very robust structure that can take an immense amount of force. So, so I think the fitness industry is still very confused to some degree yeah, yeah, yeah. about like the some pliability that exa- of fascia. Some people that know exactly what fascia is, yeah. and they're all over, and they're happy to talk about it. 
And then there's people who still think that foam rolling is going to move the yeah. fascia in your oh. iliotibial band, you. and they don't realize that <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> like this is just a like we're stimulating the nervous system here yeah. through sensory stimulation, or we're doing something else to the nervous system here. Yeah. But it so gotcha. they believe Thank that they that. are physically well, yeah. moving fascia. So in the scientific community, yeah, maybe you, you can you enlighten you're people. The, you're the first person to to come and say to make the assumption that everybody's on the steam train away from the I guess I just came from that from from that school of thought now yeah that um, I just assumed that that was, <laughs> that was we had like two lectures <laughs> in university in 2008 or 9 where they spelled out fashion they're like listen right fa- this is what fascia is ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. and one of the things I remember is they said when they got fascia they put it under a uh, uh, in a lab and they separated uh, some sort of square distance like, like four centimeters or five whatever and they pulled it, pulled it, pulled it, and it only pulled apart at the same pressure that reinforced concrete separates. And it, shri- it ripped. Maybe you should tell people what you study at university. So, so I studied a sport rehab degree, which is w- heavily on anatomy. Like for the whole first year, we were just hammering anatomy. We were looking at cadavers. We were in well, deep on the anatomy world. And our anatomy teachers were amazing. But that was enough. We Right, that's fascia. Got it move on yeah so now you were kin it to right. like having the strength and power of, of that yeah like you need yeah. it moving you need it you need a blood supply to it you need it to supply it to deliver its function but it's limited as its function it, yes it connects up and down and all over the place okay so now let's jump back so Liz can so you tell us what you have learned in Rolfing and their interpretation of fascia <laughs> yes yeah, so <laughs> what we the previous thought and by the way Ida Rolf was the one of the first people to recognize that fascia was something to recognize and observe in the body, which is why, where my thought process was, why I wanted to learn rolfing. Because I actually wanted to learn about fascia, but funny enough, I learned very little about fascia, only that we're not, the question was, are we actually changing tissue? Um, but it's, it's, uh, and, and another question that still blows my brains into pieces is, can we change fascia from the outside? So can we change tissue from the outside? So my, I'm going to answer this just based on what I think, well, right? Can I just finish really quickly? Yes, go. So what I, all I'm saying is now we, we actually use, use fascia. We, we work with tissue, but to, through the nervous system. That's exactly so what I was going like, to say. So we mm-hmm. are connecting with the nervous system, but we're listening through tissue, if that makes sense. Yeah. It probably doesn't make any sense, but but I'm listening to their nervous system. I'm watching the, yeah, yeah. The, their mm. entire body and how they respond. So my point is, we are n- we don't want it to hurt. We actually want it to feel not creepy, like where it's so soft, right? But we want it to feel <laughs> that's that can happen too, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we want it to be. We want it people to feel sensation, but we don't want people to whinge and like. And, f- and get Wins, tight yeah. because if that you, doesn't you, work. It if doesn't you say change. to me, I'm going to release your hip flexor now, like... You're already going to be off I'm, the table. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, is what yep. I, this is what I'm saying. That first session doing the breathing, I'm going to go... I need to recruit my breath mm-hmm. to, a, t- to distract me, give me a focus, give me a grounding, but also to try and calm myself down, keep me into that parasympathetic because I've just... The apprehension... My own personal apprehension has ramped me into sympathetic, and I'm just no, yep. don't go, and mm. we're not making any progress. Yep. So I've got to find a way. Okay. In that re- in that respect or that regard, what we do is we actually take your hand, and we work above your hand. So I would take your hand into your psoas, but I would <laughs> my hand like would be on top. <laughs> pushing so back. He's <laughs> basically a baby. Often <laughs> just don't, just just that. That's I can take funny. pressure, but that, I don't know, there's something, I've got a baby sensitivity to, like, anterior Sorry. surfaces, if you come <laughs> massaging me or whatever, I'm just like, That's nah. pretty funny. Freaks me out. You should try Ralphing. Someday I mean, I'll try, for say? sure. You were going to say something about... Oh, I was going to say, um, oh God, about I can't remember. System. Yeah, I was going to say when it comes to the fa- the fascial system, like you s- you mentioned that you guys approach it through the nervous system first. I was going to say the same thing, basically, just reinforcing what you said, that I think um, 
I can't exactly remember, but it had to do with the nervous system comes first in any in in my understanding, yeah, I'm, I'm, and that's I'm only on literally my my observation of my own body going through trauma and going through all of that stuff. Like I remember being in hospital and laying down, and I remember I had uh, Miffy, my therapist, coming in, and she was moving my leg, and my muscle was like totally. Uh, not dead but because the nervous system had shut it down my leg wasn't moving so the muscle was like not working but it was so tight so she would lift it and we were working at an obtuse angle so you know if you're lying down flat on your back and you draw your your right knee into your chest you can bring your knee as close as you can to your chest. So on my left side, it would come all the way. And on the right side, even though it was it had a dead muscle, it would get stuck and it would choose angle. So something had had gotten so tight and it was constricting every, everything so there was no movement. And when we were discussing that, it's like, oh, okay, so my pelvis is broken, so my fascia is now becoming the sling system to keeping everything still. So it it literally got so tight, it was acting like a, a, a physical structure mm-hmm. that was holding everything in place. Yeah. Um, and that was a very interesting observation. And the stronger or the more, once I had my pelvis reconstructed, and the more together it became, the looser that became because it was then understanding that, oh, okay, we have a pelvis. But interestingly enough, and I showed you this before, my pelvis is still broken and this side is still a lot tighter than the other side. So I think it's still... It's protecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. still yeah. holding yeah. it together. I mean, the tissue, if your nervous system, it, if, your, if your body needs protection, your, your connective tissue, your nervous system will go to protect it. Yeah, and we'll, we'll tighten it and do what totally. it needs to do. So I think what I was trying to say to you before is, is that these are just basically observations of my own body going mm-hmm. through that. So I have a feeling that my nervous system is sending out the commands. And so if I go to that nervous system first, mm-hmm. then I can... I can trigger something else yeah. via the nervous system but releasing the fascia say in my that's not going anywhere because that fascia in my right hip that's hold it's it's my hip yeah it's holding, holding. that whole structure together yeah. so just based on the observations i was going to say to you nervous system first yeah yep. is my yeah look i totally agree with you it has to be nervous system first that's i do it in the gym every day with people just getting them moving not to stress them make them tissue stronger to light up their nervous system and get them to relax and get them to be happy. So, mm. totally agree. Yep. Anyway, so Liz, is there anything that you want to finish off with before we say goodbye? So basically, Rolfing helps through these 10 series, <coughs> helps find more freedom of movement in the body. It de- downregulates the nervous system. It educates people to connect to their body as a resource, that their body is there to help them through any situation, whether it be emotional or physical or uh, mental or anything, our bodies are are here for us as a resource and so is our breath. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to try rolfing. Yeah, so how do people get in touch with you? How do they find you? I know, I've already (laughs) put dibs on this. So So I, you can find me on Instagram, Liz Terry Yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, you can email me at Liz at Liz Terry Yoga dot com. And I'm going to be working out of a holistic center called Just Be. And uh, so I'll be I'll be doing that as of next week, hopefully. You can also catch your Chaturanga workshop on our website Chaturanga yeah. workshop on the mm-hmm. website yeah we'll put a link and on the screen somewhere for it doing I don't know more. I'll figure out how to do it but <laughs> there's a link on the screen for that right now and then doing some more workshops very soon yeah, yeah. amazing we're so excited so thank you so much for yeah. thank you guys bye guys, guys, guys. bye guys